Hello students, in this video we'll prove one of the seminal theorems of complex analysis, which is the Cauchy Integral Formula. So we're going to prove the Cauchy Integral Formula. Okay. And what does this formula state? It says, but suppose that F maps omega into C is holomorphic. And omega contains a closed disk. Okay. Let's just say it contains the closure or the closure, the closure D A R closure is contained in omega. Then for any Z. In the interior of this disk, we have that f of z is 1 over 2 pi i. The integral over the boundary of that disk, so I'm going to write c, um, uh, yes, the boundary of the disk, c, ar. And then f of zeta over zeta minus z d zeta. Beautiful. Okay, that's the Cauchy integral formula. Let me draw a picture to sort of specify what I mean by this. I mean that here's omega. There's omega. And then omega contains a closed disk. So there's my closed disk, right? It should be contained in there. So make sure it's contained. I made a little, little error over there, but that's okay. There's a. And then there's R over here. And what it's saying is it's saying that take this circle over here. That's my that's gonna be my trajectory, my C, my, my circle over here is my trajectory. Maybe I should give this a little more space so that it's, it's clear that's con strictly contained in there. So let's make a little more wiggle room over here. So that's my closed disk, and there's my region omega. Okay. Excellent. Now I can pick any Z I wish. So any Z you wish inside this circle over here, let's say that Z is over here. I can find the value of f of z by integrating the function f of z over zeta minus z around the what? Around that circle over there. So it doesn't matter what z I pick, I can change z as long as I, the circle stays the same. All I have to do is change z in this formula to figure out what the function f of z is. Beautiful. This is an integral representation of a holomorphic function. It's, it may seem, why would I want to have an integral representation like this, especially where there's a kernel over here? Now, it's important to realize that zeta is on the circle over here and z is on the interior. So this is well defined over here. Excellent. Okay. Beautiful. So there's no problems with this integral over here. The integral over the circle, zeta is on the circle and z is on the interior of that circle. So there's no inner, there's no way that zeta can be equal to z. So there's no singularity over here. Perfect. Okay. So how do we prove something like this? Well, we're going to focus in on this circle and then use um, the fact that a homomorphic function has a primitive on very simple regions over here. So what we're going to do is the following. So consider, let's blow this picture up a little bit. There's my circle over here, C, which is C A R. Okay. And then I'm going to pick a point Z in that circle. Of course, the circle is oriented anti-clockwise, like this. That's my orientation of my circle. And then what I'm going to do is I'm not going to, I'm going to punch out a little narrow corridor of, of, the, of equal length over here. So I'm going to draw a corridor like that. And I'm going to draw a tiny circle. like so, okay? So this corridor has uniform length. Let's call the, the length of that corridor is going to be what? The length or the width of the corridor is going to be delta. And then the, then the radius of this little circle over here, that's z, the radius of this circle is going to be epsilon, okay? Now let's look at the orientation. The orientation is to go like this, like this, like this, like this, to continue that. And then I'm going to do what? So this is going to go like that. Oh, so that little tiny circle over there, we'll call it tiny circle over there, uh, that's going to be like a C, C centered at Z of radius epsilon, right? C, Z, epsilon. And that is oppositely oriented, right? Okay. So let's first look at that corridor, right? 
So the corridor, so first things first, if I look at this function over here, then z is the, so if I call this whole thing over here, this is, I'm gonna call this, uh, this curve, this union, the union, the curve, which is the union of the original circle of CAR, the big circle, minus the corridor, right? Minus the opening to the corridor. So I take the circle minus the opening to the corridor. I don't have that in the circle any longer. And then I add in the corridor piece, union the corridor pieces, of, the, of which there are two. Union the little circle with the corridor punched out. Union C, Z, epsilon minus the what? Minus the uh, opening to the corridor. That's a fancy way of saying something very simple. So I'm just trying to figure out what the curve is. Now, what happens to the corridor piece as delta goes to zero? As delta goes to zero, then what happens is, as delta goes to zero, what happens to the circle over here? As the width of the corridor goes to zero, the circle closes, right? CAR closes, this closes, it closes as delta tends to zero. So the corridor closes as delta goes to zero, okay? But what's the key feature of this curve, which let's call this curve over here, what, what should we call this curve? We're gonna call this curve over here, uh, gamma of epsilon and delta. Now, z is not, um, if I integrate, so I've, what I've done over here is I've eliminated that singularity over here. So if I integrate over this closed curve now, right, the integral over gamma of epsilon delta, f of zeta, one over two pi, 1 over 2 pi i, integral of f of zeta over z minus zeta d zeta is equal to zero because it's a primitive, right? Since a primitive exists, primitive exists inside. Since z is not in the interior of that curve over here. I've punched, so in other words, I've bore out a hole and bore out like think of it like, as like the cavity, right? So in other words, there was a cavity localized in the middle of my tooth. I took a drill and I bored, got the cavity out, and then all the rest of the tooth is fine. So I can integrate over the rest of the tooth in some sense, and I get zero because there's no cavity in there, there's no singularity, right? So there's, over this interior, I've, I miss what? I miss Z, and so there's no issue. I have a primitive there, so I get zero, okay? And so now what's the key feature over here? So now I wanna figure out what the, what the individual components give me over here. So the individual components are gonna give me what? And so the key feature is that we can write note. Here's the note, we're gonna use this decomposition, that f of zeta over zeta minus z is equal to f of zeta minus f of z over zeta minus z plus what? Plus f of z over z minus zeta, okay? Good. And so now what do we want to do? I want to integrate this. So I'm going to have two pieces over here. So as delta goes to zero, so first things first. So let's call this over here star, right? So as delta goes to zero, as delta goes to zero, the pieces of the contour, the corridor pieces of the contour, Cancel. Why do they cancel? As delta goes to zero, they approach the same line, and one of them is oriented this way, and the other one's oriented away from, one of them is oriented towards the large circle, one of them is oriented away from the large circle, so they're equal and opposite, so they cancel. So the pieces of the corridor cancel out, and they give me nothing, so I have two pieces to contribute, right? So I have to integrate, so zero is equal to the integral over C a r of this expression over here, f of zeta minus what? Minus zeta minus z d zeta, beautiful. And then minus, because it's oppositely oriented, the integral over c z epsilon of what? Of, now I'm gonna use two parts over here. I'm gonna use this expression, f of zeta minus f of z over zeta minus z, that's the first term I'm gonna use, and then plus what? And then plus f of z over zeta minus z d zeta. 
Okay. Now what's happening, what's happening over here is that this expression over here, since f is differentiable at z, as, um, as epsilon gets, this expression over here is just bounded, right? Because f is differentiable at z, so this is a bounded expression. This is bounded. And so I'm going to take these terms over here. If I call this term over here in absolute value, if I call that term over here 1 and this term over here 2, what can we say? I can say that 1, the absolute value of 1, is less than or equal to some constant. That, that difference quotient is bounded since f is holomorphic. I'm assuming that f is holomorphic, which means that these difference quotients are bounded, right? In other words, if zeta is not equal to z, it's clearly bounded. And as zeta gets closer to z, as zeta gets closer to z, then we clearly have a situation. That's a bounded expression over here. Bounded times the length of that curve. And the length of that curve is... Uh, 2 pi epsilon is the diameter of that, or the circumference of that curve. So in other words, i is really what? i is really small, so this tends to 0 as epsilon goes to 0. So that's good. Now let's look at 2. What's happening with 2? Well, 2 is really what? 2 is really, and I have to put 1 over 2 pi everywhere, right? So let's put a 1 over 2 pi i everywhere. I forgot that will have to come into our calculation, of course. So it's missing. Let's put it in there. So 0 is equal to 1 over 2 pi i times all these terms over here. Great. And then what's 2 going to be? 2 is going to be negative 1 over 2 pi i. And I'm going to parameterize the circle over here, right? I'm going to parameterize it as what? Negative pi to pi. And then I have f of z. That's not a zeta, so that just stays put. Over what? Zeta is going to be z plus epsilon e to the i theta minus z, of course. And then times what? Times a factor of the di differential of this. I'm going to have an epsilon, an i, and then e to the i theta, d theta. So I just parameterize the curve and plug in the parameterization. The key fact now is that the, f the z's cancel out, the epsilon cancels out, the e to the i theta cancels out, and then the i cancels out, right? And I'm missing something over here. Good. And then so I just have that the 2 is equal to what? 2 is equal to negative 1 over 2 pi f of z. That's a constant. doesn't depend on theta, right? And then what? And then, because the parameterization is based on zeta, not on, not on z, right? And then times the length of that interval is just 2 pi. So this is just negative f of z. Okay? Excellent. So now what does that say? That says that this integral over here minus what? Minus f of z is equal to what? Is equal to 0. So our conclusion, therefore, is what? Our conclusion, therefore, is that 1 over 2 pi i, 1 over 2 pi i, the integral over car, f of zeta over zeta minus z, d zeta, is equal to f of z. And there, my friends, is the Cauchy integral formula. Beautiful, okay? And so what this tells me, actually, and we're, this, you get so much, you get so many applications out of this, it's unbelievable. It won't, I mean, we could make 50 more videos on applications of Cauchy, right? There are so many applications of Cauchy. What we're doing is we're really establishing that Cauchy allows you to find, in some sense, an average value of your function relative to some kernel, okay? I'm calling this zeta minus z a kernel. It allows you to find the value of your function via averaging it over some circle times a kernel over here, right? So in other words, what we have over here is some Volterra operator, and so I'm able to recover the function via its boundary values, and that unlocks lots of mathematical properties which are commonly known as maximum principles or mean value properties, and these give you a tremendous amount of leverage in terms of making estimates. It gives you a whole bunch of really beautiful applications, so we'll spend a lot of time really just studying the applications of Cauchy in further videos. Thank you very much.